Okay, response to the smooth terrorist talking about anarchism. Words are defined through use. No series of phonemes has any objective meaning, and so language is intersubjective. Uh, and this can create problems when people have different and overlapping vocabulary sets. So if people like Sarahan and me are defining anarchism, as you say, well, tough shit. That's just how words work. Now, for the record, I don't think we are. I think Chomsky is probably the most, has the most influence on what the word anarchism is generally perceived to mean. Moreover, I haven't called myself an anarchist since around June of 2009. And since then, I've called myself an anti-statist. In fact, I've called myself an anti-statist for longer than I've called myself an anarchist. And that's because of a lot of what you, the smooth terrorist, uh, said in this video. Well, not because of what you said in this video, but because of a lot of the things that you said, you pointed out. Anyway, the meaning of anarchism. Anarchism means to be against archons. And archons, if you go by strict, strict Greek, it, uh, it means magistrate or some political ruler. But through use, the term archon has come to mean anything that influences you besides, you know, the facts, whatever. Um, what are the facts? Well, for example, religion could be seen as an archon in your life. Even if your religion has no church or a person pontificating, that is, the religion itself, the belief structure in your own brain, that's the archon. That could be called an archon. Okay, um, But this can become confusing because what is cowing to an archon and what is going along with the facts. Clearly, the religious person doesn't think he's subject to an archon. He thinks he's found the truth. Right? He thinks his actions and arrangements are perfectly rational and factual and that a rational man would do it voluntarily. The anarcho-communist doesn't think he's beholden to an archon. He thinks communism is perfectly rational and fact-based and what people will do left to their own devices. And let's be clear, like these anarcho-communists are not anarcho-Stalinists. Okay, and they generally don't have a very rigid view of how the communism will work. It can be kind of decentralized, and there's lots of lots of lots of variety of view, um, even within the same anarcho-communist. Okay, and let me put this another way: I assume you, the smooth terrorist, believe in self-ownership, that you own your own body. Why is that? Why, why do you think you own your own body? Well. Someone who thinks you don't own your own body would think that your concept of self-ownership is just an archon. And this isn't some esoteric academic thing. Uh, to a degree, do parents not own the bodies of their children? Can they pick up their children and put them to bed? I mean, we could say this is not complete and total ownership of their children's bodies, but it is a, a partial contextual ownership, we could say. You know, Or what about slavery? Now, certainly, even in slavery, you had... Uh, certain laws about how you could treat your slaves, um, and these laws were different in different times in different places, right? So you could you could have uh, ownership of people in that way, or how about the Islamic world where men own their women, right, and, and with certain protections as well. Okay, I mean th these are ownerships of other people. These are negation of self ownership. Okay, and we could draw a parallel between that and property ownership. Sure, you own the land, but you can't you know, burn tires on that land, right? So you're, so even land ownership is contextual. Similarly, uh, ownership of other beings uh, when it existed and does still exist today in, in the form of parents owning their children is contextual. And, or you could point to personal possessions like, like a toothbrush. Why do you own your toothbrush? It's just a matter of opinion. Um, there's no right or wrong on any of, the, of these things. Like you could say Bill's conception of property rights is that everything belongs to all of humanity in corporation, that the earth is a common heritage or something like that. Bob's conception of property rights could be that you own that which you can use for six, month out, six months out of the year, referencing some definition of what constitutes use. Um, and that would be the, the homesteading or active use principle. So which one of these two, Bob or Bill, is the anarchist? Well, it depends on what you th think constitutes an archon. Okay, Hitler um, often spoke about the impeccable logic of National Socialism, and all his party members would talk about, I was drawn to National Socialism because it's so logical. Okay, and the Bolsheviks also did that. They, you know, coming up with a rational day plan, a rational economic planning. They even had rational music 
<laughs> at one point in the Soviet Union. Um, and of course, atheist cult is always calling their economic prescriptions as sensible, logical, rational, and that the people who oppose universal health care as irrational, everyone thinks they're rational, and it doesn't even dawn on them. Uh, what you call liberals, I call social democrats or whatever. It doesn't even dawn on them that what they're doing is incredibly aggressive and incredibly authoritarian. In the same way, the communist and capitalist, they don't see themselves as aggressive. Right? It's all about what you think constitutes an archon. So the smooth terrorist is on the right track in this video, but he doesn't go far enough. He's still clinging to the word anarchism. And I think the word is broken, right? Archon, because archons are completely subjective. But at the same time, I think that the smooth terrorist is the most anarchist person that I've ever known. But I'll, I'll get, get get into that. Um, let's not let this linguistic confusion make us stupid. Clearly, homesteading, uh, a homesteading active use property norm is clearly the best according to most people's values, right? Homesteading means to use the land by some definition of use and to retain ownership you have to keep using it for, you know, a certain period of time, so many months a year, so many weeks a month, whatever. I mean, the the specifics are not important, it's the principle of the thing. It's active use. If you stop using it for whatever period of time is agreed upon by the common law, uh someone else can come in and use that land instead. Um and so what this does is this would allow other people to form their own kind of bubbles, right? So you could have a communist society in one bubble, a bunch of people go to a certain set of land, they use that land, and that land, and they say, well, in this area, we are going to, everything is going to be done communally, right? To a certain extent. There may be personal possessions, there may be limited private property, but everything, it's generally going to be communist land, or over this land, it'll be pure private property, okay? But through their um, the relations with between these bubbles will be like relations between private property plots because that's really what they are, um, because that's what they are agreed upon. There, that that's what comes about from the homesteading principle. So they homestead, they create their own little world, their own little bubbles, but when they're interacting with each other, they're interacting as two separate uh, property owners. So you have the communist people. When interacting amongst themselves, they all agree agree upon communism. But when interacting, you know, between the communists and the um, some private property group, they're dealing as two separate uh, corporations, uh, and, and corporations as in a bunch of body of people, perhaps delegating authority to a, a limited body of people, or however they want to interact with each other in that way. Um, so I view myself as an anti-statist meaning that I oppose the state and I define the state as a law-making agency and that's a very simple and short uh, definition uh, but there's more reasoning behind that simple definition as um, and I say law-making agency as opposed to the law taking or law discovering process of polycentric law um, now I have many other values in addition to opposing states and all and all anti-statism is, is opposing states. It's a mere negation. It implies no other values. Okay. The smooth terrorist is an anti-statist. He's also anti-private property. And according to like 99.9% .9 of people on the planet, he's an anarchist. He's against virtually what everyone would consider to be an archon. The only people who couldn't honestly call the smooth terrorist an anarchist are those who don't believe in self-ownership or the ownership of things like your toothbrush. So we're dealing with a very small, crazy group of people who would say that, who, or could honestly say that the Smooth Terrace is, is not an anarchist. Of course, there will be people who think that anarchism means a set of positive views, all right? Uh, that, that is, you need to hold these positive theoretical views, right? and those people will claim that the Smooth Terrace is not an anarchist, and they're wrong, because anarchism is just a negation of archons. Um, so basically the smooth terrorist is the most anarchist anarchist. He wants that title, I'll recognize it. It's also retarded because property rights are the foundation of agriculture and thus the foundation of, of all life beyond being a hunter-gatherer. So even a complete, I mean even a completely centrally planned economy 
or essentially planned agricultural economy, not even industrial, but essentially planned agricultural economy, requires that this a recognition that the state owns everything in order to function. Without recognized property rights of any type, then it's just you know it's just a war of all against all. We're back to being hunter gatherers. Uh, and the smooth terrorist is correct that um, that voluntary a voluntary private property society is retarded. Uh, as envisioned by those people who call themselves anarcho-capitalists or market anarchists, so I don't, I, I hate those those terms, because um, even if there's no state, there has to be law, and the law has to be enforced. Um, I mean, if you want any kind of a, you know, standard of living, um, in the stateless societies of medieval Ireland, Iceland, and the Western U.S. There was no Congress or king that could make the laws or decree them by fiat and say um, that, you know, Congress passed this bill, therefore that is the law, and everyone generally recognizes that as the law, and all the state enforcement agencies enforce that as though that is the law, okay? Um, so they didn't have anything like that, but there was still a law of the land, and this law of the land was enforceable by anyone, okay? Now, the way law forms without a state... Um, is that, for example, two people will have a dispute, and they both agree to the counsel of some trusted third party, and this third party will make a ruling, and both sides agree in advance to abide by the ruling. Okay, Both sides must agree. You, know, you can't just have one guy who picks a judge that he likes, and the other guy has to go along with it, right? creating biased judges. No, both sides have to agree, and this creates an incentive for judges, or this results in the only judges that both sides are going to agree on are judges that are perceived to be unbiased. So the third party or judge makes a ruling and these rulings become precedent. And over time people submit claims and the people they choose to resolve them become known as judges. And so in this way judges came long before kings. Over time in a given area the judges would make all these case-by-case -case rulings, and these rulings would be, would be passed down orally, or they'd be passed down and written, and they would come to be known as case law or common law. And if judges gave bad rulings, he may be overturned by the other judges. Um, this whole system was based on the perceived legitimacy of the judges. If the judges, if a, if a judge gave bad rulings, then people would stop seeking his counsel his prior rulings would be overturned by other judges, and he would effectively no longer be a judge, right? It was all intersubjective and based on a kind of, kind of agreement. The key is that there is no central agency proclaiming the law of the land. Law emerges from disputes, right? And now, I know a lot of idiots are going to say, well, this is bad, so that means the law comes about after the fact. Well... Practically speaking, even uh, king law or congress law or any other kind of fiat law system, that all comes after the fact as well, right? You didn't see like regulation of, of, of bad drugs, for example, like cocaine, uh, until after it started being used and having really bad effects, right? You'd have, you'd have co companies putting cocaine in, in, in all sorts of supposed home remedies and getting people hooked on cocaine, thinking that it was just like a, a fever cure, right? Um, you didn't see the problems, you didn't see laws against that until the problems started to manifest, right? You didn't see laws um, against, um, well, I don't, I, basically, you know, fiat law has no special knowledge that a, a polycentric legal system does not. They, I mean, congresses and kings don't have any special knowledge, uh, so there's no reason to think that they're going to come up with laws preemptively to preempt a problem that's going to emerge any more than a polycentric legal system would. Okay, so let's let's skip that kind of <laughs> that, that's kind of a bullshit a historical argument against polycentric law. Okay, um, now this polycentric law could include and did include property rights. In fact, in medieval Ireland, they had slavery. Yeah, slavery without a state. A stateless society is not necessarily, and, and not any time in history, a voluntary, a completely voluntary society. Now, in theory, a stateless society could be even more authoritarian than a state. But I don't think that would be the case, because in a stateless society, the thresholds of support required for any given law is much higher. See, if today, if Congress passes a law, even if the vast majority of people oppose it, 
it is by default accepted um, unless it's so bad that people are willing to go to the barricades and have a revolution over, over it. Um, if there are multiple legal agencies, on the other hand, and the legal agency passes a really bad, nasty law like SOPA or whatever, um, you know, you can turn to another legal agency, another legal agency, perhaps a pure private legal agency, perhaps a nonprofit one, perhaps a religious one, perhaps an ideological legal agency like the ACLU, right? And they'll all have their own judges and own perhaps judges and lawyers and, and they have their own systems and, and they'd all have to figure it out. And it would all be dependent on both parties agreeing to their counsel. So the, 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 there's a great degree of, of uh, regulation in that regard. It's not like any one of these agencies can proclaim a, a legal system. They have to come up with something that both sides will agree upon and that the other legal agencies will, will accept as valid rulings and valid due process. Right? And you have all of these different legal agencies, it becomes harder to have uh, a unified law of the land. Okay? And so we can expect – I mean – I mean, I mean there's no way – I don't have a crystal ball here, but if you have multiple legal agencies, there's not going to have unified – laws as much at least not as many I mean no stealing no murder I mean those are no raping those are pretty much universals but it's gonna be harder to have more laws more specific laws and so we can expect that there will be far fewer laws in a stateless society than a status one I mean this is something that's pretty obvious that should that should not be very controversial to say um, we can also expect a greater variety of laws and laws varying from location to location um, along with a metal law to protect people from like possible law traps. Like you could have some town saying, oh, well in this town, if you want to pass through, well what you have to do is you have to give us all of your money. That's the law in this town, right? You could have stupid shit like that. And there would be some metal law to prevent against uh, things like that and eventualities uh, like that. You know, of course, assuming that's what people want, which I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and assume that. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. Um, anarchism means nothing. Anti-statism and polycentric law are the real interesting things. Uh, actually, anarchism means to be against archons, and fake Sagan is like, excuse me, the smooth terrorist. The smooth terrorist is probably the only person I know who is, who would be considered to be opposed to all archons to like 99 Point nine percent of the people on the planet. I mean, what is an archon is subjective, but see the fake Sagan like opposes it all. So the smooth terrorist, you are the most anarchisty anarchist there is. Congratulations, you have my endorsement as as that. <laughs>